Dr Jack Carlson is going to be speaking today on the economic value of heritage to tourism for Adelaide. Um, Dr Carlson is a founder and director of Tourism Research Services, providing tourism and economic development research planning and management services in Australia and internationally since 1991. He's also an adjunct professor at Curtin University, where he established the Curtin Sustainable Tourism Centre in 2002 in his role as Professor of Sustainable Tourism. He has more than 150 academic and technical publications related to tourism economics and sustainable development, and in 2015, he was the lead author of a report for Adelaide City Council looking at the Adelaide CBD on the economic value of tourism, of heritage tourism. So please welcome Dr. Jack Carlson. Thanks very much, Natalie, and uh, thank you all for, uh, for attending today this important forum. And can I commend you at the start for um, what I've seen so far as a fairly consultative um, approach to, to these vexed questions of um, how best to plan for heritage. Um, and uh, I, I guess I've seen, you know, over, over the last 20 years, quite a lot of uh, more of an adversarial approach. And if you want to see that in detail, just have a closer look at Western Australia, and in particular the events of the last few weeks. Um, so uh, from, from an, a, an external independent observer's point of view, um, you know, it's, it's very refreshing to see uh, such a, 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 uh, an opportunity to have input into these important processes. Um, those of you, oh, and I might just point out just very quickly, I do have to leave 12 o'clock on the dot. I, I am on the panel later, um, but I do have a plan to c catch at one o'clock. So um, excuse me in advance. David Bailey has my details if anyone wants to follow up on anything I'm going to present. And I will move it through it fairly quickly, so um, be bearing in mind the time. Um, so those of you who uh, uh, have read the program and then are observing my title will notice that there's a slight departure from the original title. I've had to revert to values plural of built heritage because in preparing for this presentation, um, it became apparent there are multiple values that, that are being discussed um, in relation to heritage. And uh, whereas my focus is economic value, um, I, will, I will certainly run through and be cognizant of the others. So I will um, talk about um, the values associated with built heritage. I'll um, talk about how we go about estimating economic value of, of these places. Uh, I will certainly discuss um, Adelaide and Perth, upon which the Adelaide study was based, and the methods, very quickly, I won't bore you with the detail, of uh, how we arrive at the, uh, the estimates of value. And then um, conclude with some discussion about the nexus between um, sustainability and how we sustain the values that we, that we see in our current generation. Um, moving along, the... Um, I'm just, I've got to operate two slides here and doing two things at once is uh, quite a challenge for a bloke. Uh, so broadly speaking, in terms of uh, values of built heritage, it's quite useful to use two categories from an economic point of view, use and non-use value. And, and these are not mutually exclusive, I might add. Um, uh, so to move through them very quickly, and I will have to take a deep breath, um, Obviously on the use value side of things, which also could be referred to as monetary or utility values, um, we have heritage values, and, and, and you're all v very much aware of those and have your understanding of those. Research values, uh, the potential to yield technical information regarding historical design and construction methods. We can learn a lot from the past. The rarity value, um, something that's unique in its own right has, has value, and in fact that's quite closely related to tourism value. And uh, you know, quite often tourists will have iconic um, heritage buildings on their bucket list in terms of places to visit, and we need you know, to look no further than the Eiffel Tower for an example of that. Although I will say, I was in your GPO yesterday, and uh, I first visited Adelaide when I was 12 years old, and I, I came a long way to do that, and I was blown away then by your public art and architecture. And walking into that building yesterday, I was blown away again, and I think it's just one of these places that's uh, enduring in my, in my memory as a, a, as a place that I associate very, very strongly with, with, um, with built heritage and outstanding architecture and aesthetics. 
Tourism values um, is obviously my area of expertise, but um, we have found very, a very strong nexus and the data is showing that, uh, that uh, cultural and heritage are a major tourism attraction for all the cities around the world, but uh, as I say in particular in Adelaide. Um, the uh, financial values are, once again, uh, there's, a, there's a whole subset of values that we can associate with, um, with uh, built heritage properties. Um, and I won't go into the detail, but those accountants amongst you would, would know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and probably out of all of the academic disciplines, I think, that, I, that I've reviewed in order to prepare this presentation, um, it's the accountants that seem to have a handle on um, the, the, uh, the ways in, in which to evaluate not only the present value of uh, those properties, but future value in terms of their ability to generate an income stream. Um, from, from a range of sources, not just rent. So, um, I would, and I would count tourism amongst that revenue, uh, that stream of revenue. And then of course property value, um, which we're all aware of is, and it's quite transparent. And then there's a whole category of non-use values. Again, I'll move through them fairly quickly. They are the intrinsic values, the non-monetary values that we economists find very hard to, to attach a dollar figure to. The cultural values, socio-cultural values re uh, reflected of the day the aesthetics, um, you might call it character. And then there's a raft of option, bequest and existence values which are really drawing on the, um, the uh, literature in environmental economics um, to assign uh, the knowledge that uh, we will be able to uh, retain this building for, for future use, uh, retain it for or endow it to future generations which is bequest value and even the existence value. So not even visiting these places has value for people who take comfort in knowing that they just exist for future generations. Um, the minister touched, touched well, quite, spoke quite strongly about hierarchical values, and these are values at international, state, uh, national, state, and and local level uh, in terms of uh, built heritage, and and they're different, um, and they and they're conceptualised in different ways. Um, according, I guess, to proximity, your proximity to the built heritage. So um, their, their non-use values that people from the international bodies may never actually um, see or visit these places, but they certainly assign values to them. Increasingly, we're seeing literature on environmental values. Um, these, are the, uh, these are the reports and estimates of um, value that's generated by the fact that these buildings embody carbon, embody energy, and um, if preserved, uh, contribute to sustainability. Uh, and there's some very good work done there. And then, of course, conservation, the preservation of cultural significance, hard to put a dollar value on, but certainly, um, certainly recognised in the literature and in, in the wider body of work. So how do we estimate these economic values? Um, well, I've spent uh, quite a lot of time uh, in my career looking at these techniques and um, we have to use what's called non-market techniques because there is no um, market to capture all of those values that I just outlined um, apart from the property market and, and I think it's fairly obvious to everyone that property value does not equate to the full market value of our built heritage. So we need to use surrogate market methods, um, substitute market methods to get an indication of the value that people place on, on heritage um, buildings. So there's a raft of these, um, again arising from the uh, economic, um, environmental economics literature and, and I've certainly been applying these over 20 years and, and my colleagues as well and, and, and certainly coming up with some innovative estimates of um, not, only, um, natural, not only natural heritage but built heritage as well. And I'm sure you've, you've heard of these techniques, contingent valuation based on what if scenarios um, and willingness to pay for uh, a certain outcome. Um, this, these are hypotheticals, um, but they're the best estimates that we have in the absence of a, an actual real market. Um, and travel cost method was used extensively uh, in tourism to uh, estimate or to use a surrogate or substitute the travel cost and time that people incur in getting to a place as an indication of the dollar value that they, that they assign to that place. Um, so that's a, a rigorous and rich set of literature that uh, can, can be applied 
in the, um, <coughs> in the built heritage uh, space. Um, and then in 2004, I came across a, a technique called attribution, um, which allows us to use not, not uh, hypothetical data, but actual data, actual real money, and assign a proportion of that to uh, the existence of a certain place or natural or built asset. And uh, that's certainly uh, kept me occupied for, for quite a while. Um, and commencing... Uh, in 2004, we applied the attribution method to two national parks in Western Australia, and uh, we were successful in convincing um, state government and treasury at the time that um, places like Ningaloo Reef and the Southern Forests are not liabilities or, uh, or uh, places that necessarily incur expenditure without generating revenue. We were able to demonstrate that a substantial amount of money in the towns, the gateway towns to these places uh, are attributable, is attributable to the fact that these places exist, that they're accessible, Ningaloo Marine Park and the Southern Forests. And, uh, and that sort of helped to change the thinking around the funding arrangements for uh, the agencies like the Department of Conservation um, who are, who are um, charged with looking after these places. So that was a, a good outcome. And after that, every national park agency in Australia wanted us to do a similar valuation of, of their parks. So we were pretty busy boys for, and, gir and girls for quite a while after that. But I applied it to Heritage in uh, Heritage Place in 2005 and uh, was able to estimate that um, the Fremantle and, in, and Albany in South West Australia generated uh, $82.7 and $27.5 million dollars through tourism, through heritage tourism, um, annually to, to those towns. And, and once again, it helps people to reframe and rethink the way they value heritage. And it speaks the language of treasury. And, uh, and, and fortunately, we have to use that language in order to negotiate things like grants and, um, and funding. So um, in 2008, City of Perth asked us to do a similar study of the value of the heritage in City of Perth and cultural uh, heritage tourism. And, uh, and that uh, we were able to um, come up with an estimate of $490 million per annum, which was uh, pleasing to the City of Perth um, and helped them to, uh, to justify further uh, funding for, um, for their heritage um, efforts. And then in... Um, 2015, last year, uh, I was asked to replicate that study for um, Adelaide City Council. And once again, able to um, come up with some, some estimates, in, this time in a range, and I'll explain why we, we, we've put a range, um, from something like $375 million to $569 million, million a year <coughs> um, in, attributable to um, Adelaide's cultural heritage. Um, through tourism, and with a minimum, if you like, a minimum of the range of between 100, uh, 111 and 166 million as the substitution value, and I'll just explain quickly what they are. Um, with this technique, um, what we do is we at, we we're able to estimate the average trip expenditure per visitor um, based on existing data. $512 per person. We estimated total number of visitors to uh, our study area, which included North Adelaide and Parklands, uh, 2.722 million. Um, and they're from that able to estimate total direct visitor expenditure um, to our study area. And then through a series of um, interview questions, which uh, we administered, uh, well, which was administ administered by a professional um, market survey organisation. Um, we were able to uh, affirm and, uh, and, and estimate that um, based on three factors, and these factors um, we found through previous studies were very good at explaining people's motivations, the importance that people attach to certain um, destinations and, and characteristics and activities. Um, we were able to uh, assign 
uh, a rating to those. And they were rated at 12%, 28%, 41% and 41% percent respectively uh, in terms of um, heritage um, in, in Adelaide City. So 12% uh, of people were motivated, of our respondents were motivated to visit um, Adelaide because of heritage. 28% rated it as very important to, uh, to their trip and 41% actually undertook activities um, in heritage um, areas. So if we triangulate those, we take an average of those, um, we came up with an attribution factor of 27%. So we're able to say that 27% of, of the uh, tourism expenditure in the city of Adelaide in 2015 is, uh, is attributable to, um, to heritage. And then for the substitution method, we use a scenario question. We couldn't think of any other way to do it, but the scenario is that um, if for some reason these places weren't uh, accessible or didn't exist, what, what would you do? Um, would you substitute another heritage destination or would you stay at home? And we found that 8% of our respondents would in fact do that. So that's like a lower bound estimate. Um, that's, that's, if you like, what, uh, what you'd lose in terms of people substituting. Thanks, David. Now there are other methods available, and these are available to, at all regional levels now, um, at, L, at LGA levels, or in some cases combination, for estimating the value, overall value of culture and heritage. And these are uh, based on national visitor survey and international visitor survey data. Um, sorry, I didn't change it over. There we go. So what we have is three categories, which uh, Tourism Research Australia has kindly grouped together in terms of responses um, to their survey data. And one of them I was ple pleased to see was culture and heritage. And in the case of Adelaide, um, I recalculated just the uh, value or the number the, and uh, expenditure and value of cultural heritage, which includes um, attending theatre concerts and performing arts, visiting museums, galleries, visiting art, craft, workshops, studios, attending festivals and fairs, and cultural events, which is a big category for you. Um, art, Aboriginal art and cultural displays and, um, and heritage buildings. So built heritage, if you like, is a subset of these values, but what, we've, uh, been, what I was able to estimate for you was um, based on uh, the data, 69% of international visitors, 21% of domestic and 6% of day trip um, were classified as culture and heritage tourists in Adelaide in 2015. So an average of 32%, which is pretty, cl well, a bit, a bit higher in fact than the attribution factor of 27% that I came up with. So I, my estimate was conservative. Um, so it indicates that um, the value of um, cultural uh, heritage, or built heritage, is a subset of cultural and heritage tourism, is, is very significant. And, um, and uh, th these places provide an important setting um, for, uh, for tourism. And similarly, I did the same calculation for Perth and found the same sorts of magnitudes in terms of uh, the percentage of visitors and the value um, of cultural heritage tourism. Um, so I think it's widely recognised now that um, to, to, in order to sustain the values of built heritage, we need to capture use and non-use values. And a concept called total economic value is very useful in this regard. It captures both. Um, there's been uh, uh, some work in the literature, but largely academics have avoided um, the, the serious question of, of how best to define these concepts of value um, and built heritage. But it has to be done if we're going to have a, a sensible con conversation and and move towards um, the, um, the best estimates, if you like, of, of these places in terms of their overall value. So to summarise, we do need to address the plurality, plurality of meanings of these terms. Um, I think that would be a very, very useful starting point, and I'm sure there's enough brilliant minds in South Australia to, to arrive at that point. Um, you need to work with everyone, uh, not just property developers, but we need to get those, those that have a financial stake to, um, to recognise that the value of the property extends well beyond just the market value. Um, 
we have to get our definitions right, which is a useful starting point, and, um, and then conceptualise how best to, val how to, best to capture these values. And, and as I was suggesting, um, total economic value is a very useful starting point. So that's a very quick overview, and I will stop there in the interest of time and your morning tea, and, um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you.